homiletics, study of the art of preaching. I want to breeze through our, uh, uh, breeze through our uh, summary here. So class one, what are your expectations of a sermon? Um, uh, class two, and this is the breakdown of the recorded, uh, of the videos uh, that are on our, our YouTube channel. So uh, I know I've, I've emphasized a lot of this already in the past, so I'm just going to mention it now for the sake of our study. Class three and four, you have videos on uh, exegesis and eisegesis. Class five, the importance of preaching. Six, the types of preaching, which we are still studying right now. We started off with topical preaching, the dangers of it, the advantages of it, um, and then we had, you know, a, a homiletical exercise on it. Uh, we put our heads together concerning a, a, the topic of the Lord's Supper and how we can use different scriptures in the New Testament uh, to teach on the Lord's Supper or to, to put together that lesson uh, to inform the audience on the Lord's Supper. And then today we're going to dive into, uh, Lord, uh, Lord willing, if we get to it, we'll dive into textual sermons or textual preaching. And before we get to that, I mentioned last week um, how I, I wanted us to kind of address this uh, important question that, that Anna raised last week about the Lord's Supper. Uh, particularly the phrase uh, breaking of bread. How do, how do we know that that phrase, when it appears in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, Acts chapter 2, verse 42 and verse 46, how do we know where that phrase appears? It's actually referring uh, to the Lord's Supper. And so it goes along with this question, how do we know the Lord's Supper was taken on the first day of the week? Because that's that's what we read in Acts 20. Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached till midnight, right? And so I wanted us to kind of look at sort of the harmony of scriptures as internal evidence to, to the church in the first century, taking the Lord's Supper, observing the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. Um, the first piece of evidence is uh, the day of Pentecost, right? The day of Pentecost or uh, referred to in the Old Testament as the Feast of Weeks. This was a feast that was mandatory for the Jews to keep, and it fell, it fell on the 50th day after the Passover. So after they observed the Passover, they were to count seven Sabbaths, which is 49 days, right? Seven times seven, 49. And on the 50th day, that would be the day of Pentecost. And that's what we read. The church in Acts chapter 2 was established on that day. On the day of Pentecost, it was established. It was the day when we read this about the disciples in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Uh, verse 41 and verse 42 there on the screen. Uh, then those who gladly received the preaching of Peter were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in a breaking of bread and in prayers. Um, also, we see that in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together. I want us to emphasize uh, where it says when they came together. This was something the church did, and we read in Acts chapter 2, they were together. Um, you read throughout the book of Acts, they're often together. Here in Acts 20 and verse 7, specifies on the first day of the week, they came together. Um, also, there's, there's, there's an inference we can draw from the Apostle Paul's journey and how he, went it, he wanted to get back to Jerusalem as soon as possible, specifically uh, to be there with the saints on the day of Pentecost. Now, you, you and I both know that Paul wouldn't want to go back in Jerusalem and, and, and be with the saints to observe the Old Testament feast, right? Why would he want to be there on that specific day? It's to worship with the saints, to break bread, to observe the Lord's Supper with the saints. Acts 20 and verse 16, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost, because then 
the church would gather, it's the first day of the week. Also in Paul's letter, in 1 Corinthians 11, we also see that the church came together to observe the Lord's Supper. More clearly here in, um, in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, again, emphasizing they came together, we know is to observe the Lord's Supper. But listen to what Paul said here um, in 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 22. Now in giving thanks or in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, now when do they do that? And why do they come together as a church? We know it's to observe the Lord's Supper. When do they do that? First Corinthians uh, uh, will we'll address that more clearly here. Um, I hear that there are divisions among you and part I believe it, for there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Uh, he's referencing uh, a practice that was present in the first century, that when they came to eat the Lord's Supper, they weren't taking it in a manner that was pleasing to God. But also they had this feast uh, called the, the agape feast or the love feast that they would they would enjoy as 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 part of of their coming together as christians and so paul addresses in you know uh their their issues internally of not caring for one another in that sense when they partook of the lord's supper they're not waiting for one another when they were partaking of the Lord's Supper, they weren't examining the Lord's body as they should. As he would explain later, many of them are sick and are, 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 are weak and have died and have asleep. But also um, he's addressing when they do come together to eat their meal or the love feast, they're, they're not sharing. And that's the, the rest of that uh, instruction there. Therefore, when you come together, in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. And then he goes into, for I receive from the Lord that which I also deliver unto you. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. All right? Break bread, right? When did they come together for this? The same writer in the same uh, book in the next chapter would give these instructions. It's not about the Lord's Supper, but it highlights when they came together, right? They came together on the first day of the week and it's concerning their, their giving. Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of the week. Why not? other days of the week because there's this emphasis on when they do gather they gathered on the first day of the week we see that in acts chapter 2 when the church was established on pentecost they came together to break bread we see that in acts chapter 20 verse 7 on the first day of the week we see that in first corinthians 11 uh, and, and and 16 the same letter to the same church by the same author uh, they came together on the first day of the week now, concerning um, external evidence, uh, you can look into the, the uh, uh, apostolic fathers um, and you can look into their history and how they recorded things in their writings that show that the early church, right, the early church um, that they were uh, witnesses to observed the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day. Right, and there are a lot of historians. Take, for example, Justin Martyr is one of those uh, 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 ap apostolic fathers who lived around uh, the latter part and the beginning of the uh, first century and the second century. Uh, so he was, he was very close to the time of the church and he recorded that the Christians came together on the first day to observe and in his language, the Eucharist is the terminology that was used which is the Lord's Supper, a reference uh, to the Lord's Supper. And so uh, in regards to external evidence, there's that. In regards to 
textual evidence of how do we know that phrase breaking of bread refers to the Lord's Supper and not just their regular meal because the phrase break bread can refer to both. Uh, the Greek has a strong argument uh, for, for answering and making that very clear uh, in these passages, Acts chapter two, verse 42, Acts chapter two, verse 46, where the breaking of bread is mentioned twice, but actually they refer to two different things. The first one refers to the Lord's Supper. The second refers, um, refers to a, a regular meal, right? And the way it's worded in the Greek and kind of like in the New King James, you can see that in the breaking of bread in the Greek, the definite article is there uh, to specify a special kind of bread or special kind of breaking of bread versus in the next verse, it doesn't have that definite article in the Greek. Um, a definite article is the word da or, or, or referring to, um, to a subject here. So notice uh, in 1 Corinthians 20, you see that phrase again. And then in 1 Corinthians, I mean in Acts 20, you see that verse again, or that phrase again in verse seven but also in 1 Corinthians 10, all right? Same letter that Paul wrote, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I, I know Greek scholars. Here is what one uh, Greek scholar mentioned about um, the Acts 2, verse 42 and verse 46 breakdown in Acts chapter 2 and I quote in Acts chapter 2 verse 42 there is a reference to the disciples breaking the bread notice the article preceding bread not translated in our common versions but present in the Greek text the article indicates that a special bread is under consideration i.e the Lord's Supper um, and then also in Acts uh, 20 verse 7 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 6 the bread which we break However, in Acts 2.46, there is no article in connection with the bread. Hence, a distinction seems to be drawn between the bread, Acts 2.42, and verse 46. Um, the reference there. And he also mentioned numerous scholars do not believe that the Lord's Supper is referred to in Acts 2.46. And the, the title of the article, I got this from uh, uh, the Christian Courier. This is by Brother Wayne Jackson, Brother Wayne Jackson is a, a well-studied Greek scholar. And uh, uh, he mentioned that uh, down here that numerous scholars do not believe that the Lord's Supper is referred to in Acts chapter two and verse 46, but in Acts chapter two and verse 42. All right, so, so yes, the breaking of bread refers to the Lord's Supper. And I mentioned last week uh, that if, that if it didn't refer to the Lord's Supper, it doesn't take away the command that Christians must observe the Lord's Supper. And we know how to observe it. We see it in, in uh, Matthew chapter uh, 26, verse 26 through 28. All right. Um, is that clear as mud? Any questions about that? Any doubts on whether we should obey or we should keep the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week? All right. And if you have more questions, um, dig deeper. Let's get to textual preaching. Textual preaching is another uh, type of approach in sermon uh, preparation and delivery. One of the books I use uh, in our study is a book that I was given at preaching school, um, uh, written by a, a, a scholarly brother in Christ. And the book is called Sermon Design and uh, Delivery. It was written by brother uh, Thomas uh, Warren. And um, he gives this definition, a textual sermon is one in which the text provides both the subject and the main heads of the, of the discussion. So in other words, when you look at a specific text in scriptures, your, your sermon title is in the text 
And then the points for your sermon is right there in the text. And in, in that approach, it's easy to exegete because you're drawing out from the words of the text the main thoughts of the sermon. Um, in the book, it also mentions this. There are two main characteristics of textual sermons. One, uh, the main heads of the sermon should be natural and easy. The very words of the text should, employ, should be employed in the statement of these main points, if at all possible. Two, the sermon should reveal a distinct advance of thought. Each main part of the sermon should carry the theme or step closer to the uh, climax of the discourse. So in, the, in that first part, again, I already mentioned that, there are a lot of Bible texts that easily give us a textual sermon, right? Um, one approach in finding textual sermons is look for lists. <laughs> look for lists, right? Well, what are some of the lists that you are aware of in Scripture? Well, love is. 1 Corinthians 13 can be a textual sermon because the sermon is there. You know, what is love? And then the points of the sermon would be the definition of love as given in the scripture. That's an easy textual sermon right there. All right. Also, that, that text right there can also be expository. All right. What, what other list comes to mind as well? Through the spirit. All right. Uh, in, in Galatians 5, go there with me. All right, if I show up at a church building and their preacher is not there and they ask, can you preach, brother? You always must have a sermon ready to go. And when you think about lists in the Bible and you have a working knowledge of Scripture, that's a great way to go if you don't have a sermon in your pocket. Think about lists and take the brethren there and preach through the list, right? Um, there in, in Galatians, uh, notice with me in, in, in chapter 22, what would be the sermon title? I mean, chapter f 5, verse 22, sorry. <laughs> chapter 5, verse 22. What would be the sermon title? Simple, it's right there. The fruits of the Spirit. That's our sermon title, right? And then, and then the, the points would be, each of those things. That would be a textual sermon, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. And the way you would introduce the sermon is you talk about walking in the Spirit. You back up in a verse, verse 16, right? The, the title is the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 16 is how we introduce the text, right? Or introduce the sermon. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the, of the flesh. Then you ask a question, how do we walk in the spirit? Or you ask another question, why do we walk in the spirit of God? Well, here's why we walk, because the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And notice, I didn't say a thing from my own opinions. We're just reading Bible. We're just hearing from God himself. I love textual sermons because that's, that, that's usually the nature of the sermon. It's a lot of it is God speaking and less of the preacher speaking. And one of my mentors said, in your sermons, make sure God has more to say than you. Because we're not preaching us, we're preaching God's word. All right, so you, you work that entire text all the way down and then you you, you defined it and then you concluded, verse 25, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. All right, so, th so lists are a good way to go. Uh, sometimes you wanna look at a uh, text that shows progression. That's the second part there, like a, a flow of thought. And another list comes to mind. What would be that list? When you think about a flow of thought or a thought building on another, there's a list that would come to mind. What would that be? It has something to do with addition. Second Peter one, verse five. 
add to your faith, right? Add to your faith this, and to this, this, and to this, this, and to this, you see a natural flow. That's the second part there. It reveals a distinct advance of thought. Each main part of the sermon carry the theme or, or set up closer to the climax. Let's go there to 2 Peter 1. And, and that's a perfect uh, text for this definition because it, it, Peter, the way Peter wrote that passage, it does set you up for the climax. The climax is your entrance in heaven, right? If you go to the second Peter one, you notice that second Peter chapter one, um, <clears throat> notice verse, uh, uh, verse, uh, verse 11, that would be the climax there. Um, well, let's combine verse 10 and 11, the climax of the sermon. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the climax of that teaching, right? You do this because this will happen when you do this. But the sermon starts from, you know, actually you start, I, I preached this before, I always, start, I always start with verse three. Because verse three tells us, yeah, his divine power has given to us all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called, you, uh, who called us by glory to virtue. And then verse five would be the, 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 the introduction, you know, but as for, for this very reason, Giving all diligence, so here's your progression, add to your faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, love. And you take time in your sermon to define what those are. And after you define what those are, you want to ask why. Well, why should we do these things? For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we do these things? For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his sins. Why do we do these things? Verse 11, so we have this entrance uh, to eternal glory that God has prepared for us. So in textual sermons, the lists are a good way to go Sometimes it's the, the sermon is in, in the punctuation, right? In, 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 the, in the punctuations that the Spirit uh, uses uh, uh, for, for emphasis. Uh, look for commas that explain things. That can be your sermon. You look into the text and say, and Paul makes a statement and there are commas that define the statement made or that supports the statement made, uh, made by the Apostle Paul. Take for example, here's another list. All right. Second Timothy three, sixteen through seventeen. All right. Second Timothy three, sixteen through seventeen. And your points are divided by the commas that Paul made there. What would be the title of this sermon if you were to use this text and just this verse? Right, to use this text as your, as your main text for your sermon, how would you, uh, what would be the title of it? Okay, the inspiration of scripture, that can work. What else? Being equipped, yes. How are we equipped, right? That would, that can be the the title. Being equipped. So how how do we do that? And then you go through the list, go through the list, all right. Uh, one that I came up with is the word of God is profitable because it's right there, right? The word of God is profitable. It's right there in the text. Um, not that uh, inspiration is not there. It's there. Being equipped, it's there, right? But that's the idea of a textual sermon. Um, so if this is the, the, the title, what do we think the main points are? <laughs> right from the verse, right? The word of God is profitable. What is the word of God? It's all scriptures. 
define the word inspiration. Theonoustos in the Greek, God breathes. It's the only time it appears in the entire New Testament. That Greek word appears here once. It's the same breath that gave man life. Genesis, right? And God breathed into his nostrils the living word. That same breath is in the very words of scriptures. So scriptures is a living word. You might throw in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is alive and is sharper than any to his sword, piercing to the dividing of soul and spirit. The word of God is profitable. There's a lot of Bible verses that you can bring under that title to introduce. You don't have to. You can just stay here. The word of God is profitable. Profitable for what would be the question if you like questions. All right. Uh, well, here are the main points. The word of God is profitable for doctrine. There, there, there are people that don't understand what the word doctrine means. So you take time to explain. This word means teaching. Right? The word of God is profitable for our teaching. You can bring in supporting texts like uh, 1 John, uh, uh, or not, not 1 John, 2 John uh, verse 9. Can someone read that for us? 2 John verse 9 concerning teaching. We got to have the right one. And the word of God is the right teaching. Someone read that for us, 2 John 9. All right, so we got to abide in the doctrine of Christ, the teachings of Christ. Right, so we, we spend time in the first thought to ensure that, that, we, that we emphasize that the word of God is profitable for our teaching. It teaches us. Point number two would be reproof. The word of God is, is profitable for, for reproof. And someone might not really understand the word reproof. It carries the idea of convince, uh, convincing someone or persuading uh, someone or Sometimes the word conviction is in that uh, concept of, re of reproof. It convicts us. That never happened, does it? Does it happen? When I read my Bible, does it convict me? Yes. All right, so that's what it's good for. Conviction is good. It's good to be convicted. All right, because it shows the conscience is alive. It shows that conscience is still motable. It's when we hear the word of God and we're not convicted that we are in trouble, right? Because the conscience is no longer motable or it's seared, as Paul would say. Uh, it's profitable for our reproof, and then you would emphasize that. The word of God is profitable for our correction, right? It corrects us. When we are in the wrong, it corrects us. It is a word that we use to correct others called accountability. All right? Well, here's what the Bible says. All right? And then the last point would be it's profitable for instruction in righteousness. Uh, the, the, the Greek word there is close to the word discipline or training. All right? So it tells us what is right and how to do right. And that's important, right? Because uh, right nowadays, uh, according to the world, is relative, right? It's right if this happens. It's right, uh, in that case it's right, in this case it's not right, right? Some people treat the truth that way. They say truth is subjective, right? Uh, uh, it, you know, it's true in this case, it's not true in that case. Your truth different from my truth. You know, you hear that in the world today. The word of God is absolute truth. It is always right when it says what is right. It will, it, it, when, it's, when it says something is wrong, it will always be wrong. Uh, take, for example, in our country in 2015, right, they passed that law on... on uh, a same-sex marriage law that they decided this is now an acceptable law in the country. But no matter how many times this country legalizes sin, it's still gonna be wrong. 
because the word of God says is wrong. And his word is the standard, right? His word is the standard. And what would be the conclusion of the sermon? I'll give you a clue. I'll give you a key. Verse 17. All right. That would be the conclusion. All right. The word of God completes us. It thoroughly equips us for every good work. When we're studying with, with, with people that are lost and, and uh, when we get to the part of the study that we talk about the authority of the word of God, this is one of those passages that we read. And after we read this passage and they read verse 17 and it says it thoroughly equips one to every good work. The follow up question or the fill in the uh, blank that, that comes after it says what equips you for every good work. And they know the fill in the blank or they know the answer because they just read it. The word of God and then the follow up question after that is do we need other books to equip us for God's work. Do we need someone's opinion to equip up for, for God's word? Do we need the catechism, the Book of Mormon? Do we need other manuals to equip us uh, for the work of God? And those are all in the, in the study, uh, back to the Bible study that I use. And they, they answer it for themselves. They say no. And there are many Catholics I study with, they realize that and they say, yeah, I don't need the Pope to tell me how to be fully equipped. I don't need the catechisms to tell me to be fully equipped. I've had Mormons tell me that. Yeah, I don't need the Book of Mormon. And you name it, Baptist manual, Methodist creed, almost every denomination has their own thing. The Apostles' Creed. Authority, right? And that would be the essence of this sermon. It's about authority. We only have God's word and it is enough. It teaches us, it convinces us, it corrects us, it disciplines us, or it trains us, and it fully equips us to serve the Lord. Now, if you're not a Christian, and then we offer the invitation, right? That's a textual sermon. Right from the text, and it's right there. So. So if, if uh, uh, men, if you find yourself visiting and there's no preacher, I just gave you three sermons, free of charge, all right? Um, the next couple of sermons I'll give you, I will charge you for it. Any thoughts on, on textual sermons? And, and we're gonna do some, some more exercise going for, further and more things I wanna cover going further. Uh, but what are your thoughts this evening? What are your thoughts about textual sermons or, or textual preaching? Absolutely. You can't go wrong if you're saying what God said. <laughs> you know, and that, you know, that's, that's preaching. Say what God said. Right? Say it over and over. Say it multiple times. That's preaching. Uh, for, for the sake of our Zoomers, uh, uh, Yona mentioned, you know, the, the advantage of that is that you're centered on the Bible and, and you don't, you hear more from God because those are the points from the Word of God than then, um, then, then, you know, going into the danger of opinions and, and whatnot. Any other thoughts? All right. I didn't think I would get to this part this early. So we got, we got some time. So we finally get back to our sermonizing. What makes a sermon uh, good? We haven't gone, gone back to this. And we're looking at the Sermon on the Mountain uh, and, and, you know, we're reading a text and come up with 
a thought or a theme or a title of a sermon that you get from the text. So we already uh, uh, covered uh, this section, but we'll go all the way uh, to where we left off, right? Uh, a sermon is good when it gives us hope. A sermon is good when it reminds us of who we are as God's children. And these are all thoughts drawn from the, from when you read the Sermon on the Mountains, uh, Sermon on the Mountain, these are the thoughts that come out uh, from the text that I have uh, preached already. I preached this sermon in 20, I think it was 2019, I preached this sermon. Um, a sermon is good when it corrects our misunderstanding, and uh, we covered that the last time. Uh, and then this is one more. We'll, we'll talk about this one now. A sermon is good when it encourages us not to hate and to seek reconciliation with others. And I'll read the text, and I'll, I'll open it up for what would be your sermon title from this section of the text or your point from this sermon of the text or this part of the text. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift uh, there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hand you over to the officer, and you be uh, thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will, be, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. So, so an overall thought is... Why I put that up there when it encourages us not to hate, because Jesus addresses that. He skips the act of murder and goes to what starts in the heart, and, and that's the 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 hatred. Um, and and then it encourages us to reconcile with others. How would you, or what point, would you come up with from this specific part of the Sermon on Mountain? What 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 other part can be the emphasis? Yep, settle your differences. That you could preach an entire sermon from here. Uh, you know, uh, settle uh, the the matters before they escalate, right? Or settle them quickly before you know, before they, they, they get worse or before it goes further to a point um, as described there at the end and you will pay for the full extent of it. What else? Oh, Pat, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Great question. Um, so, so Pat mentioned the idea, and and it, this happens in, in the church. Sometimes you try to reconcile. Uh, um, uh, the differences, or you try to go through reconciliation with someone, and after you make effort to to reconcile that relationship, um, and they still do not change, or they're still not forgiving or or, or repenting, um, what do you do? All right, um, write a Facebook post about it. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, what do you do when, he, when you talk about reconciliation, the idea of reconciliation? What is involved in reconciliation? What needs reconciliation? 
what, why is reconciliation a thing? Think about in our relationship with God, we need to be reconciled to God so something happened. Well, forgiving is part of it, but something happened. Say again. An offense. Sin. When it comes to our relationship with God, we need reconciliation because of our sin. And that's the idea of reconciliation. A sin has occurred. And if you go to your brother or your sister in Christ and try and address that sin, well, we, our sermon this Sunday will touch on that. Uh, um, it, will, it will cover that. But, but reconciliation, there's a process. There's something that you can do. But sin has to be involved. In, in order for this to be an effort to reconcile. If it's something that you don't like, that's not sin, right? That's something you could just talk about on the side. And, you know, I just didn't like that. You know, reconciliation means sin is involved, right? And that must be first established. Because if you're going to someone about, you know, just... Uh, maybe just hurt feelings over a misunderstanding or, or something that is not sinful, then, then that's not what Jesus is emphasizing. What Jesus is emphasizing, especially in Matthew chapter um, uh, 18, 15 and onward, which we'll focus on on Sunday, um, he's talking about a sin because he said, if your brother sins against you, go to him. Between you and your brother, if he, if he hears you, you won your brother, Right? And then he tells us what to do. If he will not hear you, take two or three more. If he will not hear two or three more, tell it to the church. If he will not hear the church, let him be to you as a tax collector. In other words, withdraw from him, right? Sometimes that's hard to do if the parties involved do not understand how serious sin is. If sin is something we take lightly, then we won't see the need for going to our brother, for, you know, for, for looking for reconciliation. That's often the case because we have tolerated sin or we have changed our view of sin or our view of sin is not something uh, that will send us to hell. That's why reconciliation is important. Right. Um, well, I'm going to stop here. I'm not going to go over time, uh, but but yeah, um, we'll we'll cover that. I'll co I'm covering that in in my sermon. What do you do? Um, and at the end of the day, you leave it up to God after the process, because God will be the ultimate judge. Right? You leave it up to God after you have carried out what Jesus said for us to do. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word and for loving us, Lord. Thank you for the guidance that you continue to give us through your word. Help us to continue to grow, Lord, in our knowledge and in application of your word. Thank you so much, Father, for the many things you have done for us. Uh, that you have done through us and with us, Lord. Uh, as a church, Father, we love you and we want to serve you and to do things that are pleasing in your sight. And we ask, Father, that you have mercy on our souls when we fail to obey you. And help us, Lord, and strengthen us and give us the courage and the wisdom uh, to walk in obedience to your will. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus and his willingness, Father, to die on the cross so that we can be forgiven. We thank you so much, Father, for his example in obedience and humility that we should follow as, as your people. Father, we thank you for this avenue of prayer where we can come to your throne of grace to find help in the time of need. And Father, we pray a uh, special blessing on, on Uncle Pat, Lord. Uh, we thank you, Father, for blessing him uh, with another year in life. We thank you for his service to you and, 
and to your kingdom and, and to your people here in Honolulu. We pray, Father, that you continue to bless Uncle Pat with wisdom and strength and, and good health so that he can continue to serve you. Father, we thank you for, for Kirsten and her time here with us uh, as she prepares to return back. Lord, we ask for safe travels for her. We're so thankful for a good visit with her and, and her time here with us. Uh, please be with our Lord and, and bring her home safely. Father, we also pray for Basilia as she is uh, returning from traveling, Lord. Also provide safe passage for her uh, so she can be back home with us again. Father, we have many personal struggles, uh, our own trials and tribulations that we deal with, Lord. Help us, Father, and, and please grant us our petitions. Nevertheless, not our will, but your will be done. Keep everyone safe, Lord, as we depart from this building. Bring us back safely in the next appointed time. May we continue uh, throughout our days, Lord, uh, to be faithful to you and to serve you and do things that bring honor and glory to your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.